Well, good afternoon, investors. Welcome to the December 6th edition of Bull Sessions. My name is Mark Robertson. I am joined here by my colleague, Ken Kavula. Good afternoon, Ken. Good afternoon, Mark. Uh, and today, actually, uh, our, our, our audience is wonderful, Mark. Our audience is even filling in the words I can't come up with anymore, okay? <laughs> well, uh, George tells me that my broker was Scott Trade. He's absolutely He's right. actually right. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, George. It's, Appreciate that. It, it's so much fun because we could sit here and issue fill in the blanks moments all afternoon long, and <laughs> they would all fill them in. Uh, <laughs> it's it's actually like having a safety net, I guess. And you're probably of the opinion that I need a safety net from time to time. <laughs> we're we're at the point in our marriage, Mark, where I think half of our conversation is filling in the other person's words, oh, no. Natalie filling in mine and me filling in hers. So, Yeah, that happens. All right. Well, here's what we will kick around today. It is December. It is December 6th, and we probably should take uh, a moment just to remember that we're, uh, um, it's basically Pearl Harbor Day. And for many of us, and in many of the people in the audience that has uh, family moments, friends, and connections going back to that moment in time. And uh, it's just one of those days, that's for sure. Certainly the, the world changed that day. So something to remember. All right. Um, basically have a busy schedule here today. Um, do want to talk about this notion of backing up the truck for an opportunity and I'm going to lean on the Beverly Hillbillies and Jed Clampett and uh, the notion of Texas gold, sending that family to Beverly Hills back. When was the, when was the Beverly Hillbillies on TV? Oh golly. I can remember it being on when I was in high school and that was in the mid sixties, Mark. So okay. well, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure that our audience will fill that one in too, but yeah, yeah. I remember watching it uh, in black and white. Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're getting confirmation from folks in the audience <laughs> that it was on in the '60s. Yeah, and of course Jethro and Granny was Granny was a superstar, uh, but she was a heck of a stock picker when she got together with the <laughs> bankers. All right, so we are going to talk about that. Uh, I spent a moment with um, uh, Steve Gideon's question on Striker about the difference between some statistics so we want to spend some time talking about that go a little bit surgical going to spend a few moments talking about apple and whether apple's a good company or not uh, interesting thought there and then for our christmas cage match for the day we're going to basically debate whether or not to expect a december santa claus rally or and I hesitate to put it there because I, I don't understand it yet, but the cocaine bear is a movie that is coming out about a bear that ingests uh, that uh, particular drug and goes on quite a rampage. And he was referred to as an apex predator in the movie. So does Santa win or does the bear win? And maybe we can debate that. And I don't know. We could have had a poll, I suppose, but, uh, were you familiar with that movie coming out, Ken? It's not the kind of movie that draws my attention, Mark. So. It, it doesn't get mine either, other than I'm, I'm just curious as to how in the world you make a movie about that. And I actually have an ounce of compassion for the bear, which uh, was impacted by stumbling into some uh, illicit drugs laying in the forest. So it doesn't, doesn't sound like all that good to me. Maybe I'll wait until it's essentially free on Netflix before I watch it, but oh well. So it's the bear versus Santa, who who wins, Santa Claus or Alley, or are we going the other way? All right, so with that, let's go ahead and get underway. A lot of very familiar names, welcome back. If you are new here, no investment recommendation is intended. That's in intended for the, the loyal uh, returning audience members also. This is all about education. It's a demonstration intended for education and literally for sharing, trying to illustrate and demonstrate the methods, philosophies, and techniques of the modern investment club movement as interpreted by us at Manifest Investing and as promoted and championed by the National Association of Investors, also known as Better Investing. And uh, 
All of it is wrapped around the modern investment club movement and the way they look at the investing world, buying better companies at better prices. You'll hear opinions from us. Please do your own homework before making a, an investment decision. If we own a position in the securities that we discuss, we'll try to remember to let you know about that. Um, we do a monthly webcast called The Roundtable where the intent is quite simple. It's simply share and analyze three, four, or five ideas. And we've been doing that monthly since 2010 and uh, having a lot of fun and also generating some pretty decent ideas over the years. If you'd like to be added to a reminder, an email reminder list about that particular webcast, it's generally on the, the last Thursday of every month. Excuse me. Last Tuesday of every month, Mark. Why do, why do I do that? I have I have something I have something gone bad in my wiring. Um, <laughs> last Tuesday of every month, eight thirty Eastern time, in your jammies with the adult beverage of your choice. Send an email to nkabula one at comcast.net, and Natalie will be happy to remind you when we're doing that. If you have follow up questions, would like copies of slides or basically anything on your mind. Uh, including suggestions for future topics, send an email to either one of us, Mark R at manifestinvesting.com or kcavula1 at comcast.net. Anything else, sir? Nope. Uh, let's put our feet on the ground and get moving. All right. I love this, Mark, because last uh, bull session, I, I said I was eagerly waiting for the green line to touch the blue line, and look at what happened. I figured you're in cahoots with Powell. Must be. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think it came back just a tiny bit off of that, but uh, as we admitted several times over the last few months, we we said it will touch the blue line whether you believe it or not. We just don't know when or for how long, but it will happen. And uh, I just think that that graph does show a little bit of the bubble that happened post-COVID. And uh, the average stock right now is running at about a return forecast of approximately 13%. That's based on all of basically the average of all of the companies in the value line investment survey. And uh, it's kind of in a mid range, maybe slightly uh, undervalued right now. In other words, you should yeah, find I, a few more stocks in the buy zone than, than what you have been. But uh, that's kind of the condition I, we're in. I got the question twice last week in my email from folks that obviously come to the uh, bull sessions, Mark, and both folks wanted to know uh, what was that average return benchmarked against, and I referred them right back to the slide itself. In fact, I took a copy picture of this slide and sent it to them, and uh, just for the rest of you in the audience, uh, the very last sentence in the explanation that a lot of times none of us read uh, is down there at the bottom, and it tells you that uh, what it's based on, and over uh, a 30 year period, it looks like the return has been uh, about 11 and a half percent. So that'll give you an idea of where the market is today compared to where it's been historically. We actually have that for, number for this group well. of stocks. Yeah, right. We have that number all the way back into the 1960s from uh, working with Value Line. And the number really does approach, depending on the number of years that are in the sample, um, 10 or 11 percent. Uh, you go back 50 years, you go back 60 years, you get into that 10 to 11 percent range. So it gives a, a frame of reference, some context for that. I did have a little bit of fun this week with uh, Tin Cup. Um, you talk about a roller coaster ride. Uh, I think this captures perfectly the type of confusing market we've been in for the last couple of years. Um, I believe that we were in some kind of a bubble all throughout that process. I got to admit, I was anxious and confused. Was I smart enough to convert some of that stuff up at the top to cash? No, um, not in my personal investing and certainly not with 10 cup, but I think it really does show how uh, roller coaster E the market has been and i do like this notion of even though this is a, a managed portfolio of that blue line being kind of a reality any thoughts on that ken well i like the fact that the last couple of dots have been moving up rather than down uh you know i i happen to feel that we're in a kind of a of a wide range right now and that we're going to stay there for another 
four or five months until we get some uh, real definite ideas coming from the Federal Reserve. I just get a little bit uneasy when I get the feeling laying in bed at night that that they're still undecided about what they want to really uh, do with the, with the whole uh, interest rate uh, economy slash uh, quantitative tightening, quantitative easing, all that stuff. Uh, I'm just not sure they've actually made a decision yet and that they're hiding behind this data-driven idea. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, you know, how many decisions can you make based on a single data point? They should have, they should have some general philosophy or some general strategy by this point. It seems that, that they're not willing to communicate it. So it's, it's a little bit unnerving. And again, I'm glad to see the lines moving up at the moment rather than down, even though today's yeah. a kind of a rotten day in the market today. Yeah. And the other thing that we talk about all the time, you know, you look back to 2008, 2009, that was a horrible moment, but it's really kind of hard to see the, the, the downward bump here. Um, I have a hard time believing that if we are both still alive 25 years from now, we'll be looking at this chart and this bump will be invisible. Uh, I don't think it's going to be invisible. <laughs> oh, oh, well. Next slide. All right, just some general slides about the economy. As you know, we do watch uh, the, kind of the housing situation and uh, talk about it all the time. We actually think that many of the housing residential construction companies are, are investment worthy with a long-term perspective. And uh, this is a longer term perspective on purchase activity in housing. And I believe the point of this slide from that calculated risk blog was, we actually have reached levels not seen since 2009. And we reached them in a hurry. I, I would argue we reached them in too much of a hurry. So between that one and then this slide, which Sean sent over, it just illustrates that uh, the activity in housing, especially single family homes, has, has basically gone off the charts to the downside um, faster than any time we've ever seen. So maybe this dovetails with your comment about, I hope they're watching this one too, Ken. Well, and and I think there's another graph that this one is inversely uh, tied to, Mark, and that's the, the uh, rate of the hikes, uh, how many months between hikes. And I do know that that string of 0.75 hikes over a three month period was the fastest cumulative raise in rates uh, in a very, very long time. So maybe the steepness of the housing decline is directly tied to the steepness of the rate hikes in interest going from, from virtually, you know, nothing to 3% up to, to around what, five and a half, six, six and a half, seven percent now. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely hovering at seven for a while, so we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know the correlation between recessions and uh, the the Treasury spread between the ten year and two year is something that seemed to be fairly reliable historically, and uh, I have argued that we've at least been in in rotating recessions across sectors for quite some time already, and uh, the profitability characteristic that we put up basically says we're already there in a recession. I don't care how you define it, and uh, that that. Uh, Yield curve inversion is definitely shown in, in a big way on that chart on the left. And then, Ken, I thought you would enjoy this one because Ross Meredith, I, why don't you go ahead and tell the story here, what Ross shared with our roundtable audience last month. Well, uh, a little bit of, of color, a little bit of background. Ross Meredith is a retired uh, bank examiner working for the uh, agency in the federal government that goes out and examines the health of banks and and then contributes to putting a, uh, it's not exactly a rating, but contributes to telling the banks whether they're operating uh, within the regulations or not, and also how healthy their balance sheets happen to be. Uh, on the last roundtable on the last Tuesday of, of last month, uh, our uh, friend, uh, I'm sorry, Cy Lynch, our buddy from Atlanta, 
uh, presented a company called First Foundation, which is a small asset management company uh, that does banking out of California, Southern California. And I presented Western Alliance Bank, which is a, uh, a medium-sized regional bank uh, out of the same general geography, although Western Alliance has been opening uh, offices all over the country and expanding its footprint. And Ross Meredith, who happened to be in our audience, said, uh, would, would we like a comment from him about how, how he views uh, the financial industry, specifically the banks? And of course, we said, of course we would. And uh, he gave us this quote right here, which dovetails exactly with what Cy and I were thinking and saying at the round table, that this might be the, the most opportune time in most folks investing history uh, to buy a bank and then to put it away for a reasonable amount of time as the economy catches up uh, and begins to grow again. Uh, everybody feels that banks are going to become important. Uh, when there was zero interest uh, rates going on, uh, money was uh, at a place where a lot of folks could get money from a lot of places. They didn't have to go through a bank to make it happen. But as interest rates go back to more historic levels, uh, banks are going to become important again. And Ross indicates that as far as he's concerned, these are tailwinds that banks have not seen in 20 years. So that's that's investing history for a lot of folks in our audience. Uh, if you don't own a bank or an asset managing company right now, or even an insurance company, now might be an opportune time for you to take a serious look. I, I should include brokerage houses in that list of mm -hmm. possibilities but now might be an, a really opportune time. There's some great looking stock selection guides out there for, for these institutions. And uh, we've come up with some uh, relatively easy ways to come up with proxies for uh, your stock selection guide, if that's what you're using. And when you use the assets as a proxy for sales, and when they're both growing at about the same rate, then the stock selection guide becomes something that is basically looking uh, the same as far as method is concerned, looks the same as almost any other SSG that you do. Now, you want to make sure that assets are growing as quickly as traditional uh, sales are growing. But if that's happening, the SSG really becomes something that uh, – does it require a whole lot of mind stretching in order to do? Uh, we also include a number called return on average assets, ROAA. And when that number is moving up around one five and staying there for two or three or four years, then you know you're looking at some kind of a, of a banking institution that really has uh, some good things going for it. You know, I do think it's it's somewhat intuitive based on your own wallet. I mean, I watch the the home mortgage rate go from basically 3% to 7%. But uh, maybe I'm the only one in the world or the only one in the country that sits there looking at money market rates, they still seem to be stuck down around zero. So yeah, that that's a, that's a macro thing for sure. All I right. will say, Mark, that I'm, I'm noticing a distinct increase in the interest that my brokerage firms are are paying me for money that I for cash that I'm holding in my brokerage firms. I mean that used Definitely. to be uh, that used to be in pennies uh, the 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 monthly uh, return and and now it's up into the forty fifty sixty dollar range. Uh, so there's a, a huge difference in in the interest that uh, brokerages are paying, and I'm starting to notice advertisements all over the place. Uh, for fixed income uh, certificates, uh, you know, the old uh, uh, certificates of deposit, uh, mm -hmm. and those CD rates uh, for, in, for in, in a lot of the advertising cases are moving to two and a half, three, three and a half, four percent. Now, they, you got to really, you know, scope them out and find out what the rules are behind them and everything, because a lot of times there's, there's some gotchas in there and you don't just want to lay your money down. But 
I certainly think that, that the returns are beginning to move in the direction where savers are going to be rewarded again. Yeah, they're coming up. They're just, my point is they're not moving anywhere near as fast as the mortgages. And it's, that's sort of like gas prices, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oil, oil goes up and gas prices <laughs> follow within the day. Oil goes down and it takes four weeks for the gas prices to, to move down again. You're so. just going to make the audience dizzy talking about that. <laughs> All right. Here's our top 40, current top 40 for the groundhog. Um, you'll notice that neither Ken nor Mark are on here, at least not yet. we got two months to go. Uh, notables on here. Herb still holds down the number one individual slot. Um, David Einhorn's this, in the celebrity slot. Notice that uh, Kevin Gologli's Montgomery County checks in with the, as the group leader. And the monkey has slipped down to 18th. The one that kind of jumped at me this week, in addition to Kurt and Cy both being on the list and representing us, but uh, Abby Jo Cohen has been steadily moving up this list. And uh, might take a look at her holdings to see what's going on there especially if she continues moving up the list. George Mackey's on up near the top. Um, just some interesting stuff going on. We have never seen so many celebrities at the top of this list in 16 years. And it just makes for uh, an observation that this market is different in many ways. Might, might be interesting to look at those uh, wide moat undervalued stocks from Morningstar. Uh, down in spot 35 too, Mark. Yeah, they've been climbing. See what they're looking at and see if that translates to anything that we can look at. And if somebody ring a bell, Kathy Wood is no longer in last place. She <laughs> slipped up to 165th, and we'll see if that's a, a trend. And let's hope it is, because one of my positions is her innovation fund. All right. Let's talk about a couple of questions from subscribers. This one came from Steve Gideon, um, basically noticing a difference in uh, a variety of resources for earnings, in this case, comparing Value Line to Morningstar. And I wasn't aware that the difference was this large in this case. I, I got to confess. Um, one of the reasons that we look at both sources and, and make a value judgment is because of things like this. We do see this from time to time, but I'll draw your attention to just, let's just talk about the earnings number. Um, value line obviously for last year had it coming in at 909, and you can see on a traditional stock selection guide that it's at 521, pretty significant difference. And unless I'm missing something, Ken, it's not completely explained. Um, I mean, maybe close, but not, qu not quite completely by their uh, financial adjustment that they made for 21 here. And uh, just to confirm the difference, Morningstar checks in. You can see that right here, pick your flavor of earnings. But uh, you can see that that difference actually holds out fairly true. When you compare it versus the actual numbers reported on 10Ks and uh, in the company literature, you do find that these numbers do line up as adjusted. So I'm not, I'm not here to say that they're wrong. Uh, I guess the way I would characterize this, and then I'll turn it over to you, Ken, is I think of when I'm going through a stock analysis, I'm trying to form an understanding of a representative understanding of the company going forward. I'm always going to be leaning more on continuing operations or the information that I do and conditioned, or as they say here, adjusted to uh, basically reflect what they, in their opinion, is the continuing operations, both backwards and forwards down here. So to me, this is a more representative case for a company like Stryker. You still have the downdrafts in 2013, 2014 because of the Affordable Care Act and what it did to the company. And then you also have a bump here from COVID. So that's, that's my two cents. Um, there's different flavors. You have to understand the flavors that you're dealing with and, uh, that's that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. How do you feel about this, Ken? Well, um, I this is an example of something that Mark and I were talking about prior to the uh, workshop opening today. Um, if you uh, add back that two dollars and ninety cents to the uh, five twenty-one, uh, then you're coming uh, 
uh, close to the, uh, you're, you're a little bit better than $8, let's say that. And uh, the reported number uh, coming from Morningstar is, uh, I'm sorry, coming from Value Line is 909. So in other words, there, there seems to be about a dollar, a little bit more than a dollar kind of floating around somewhere. I think the third leg of this tri-legged stool that you'd have to check to see what's going on is the Stryker uh, 2021 uh, earnings press release or the actual Stryker 2021 annual report. Um, in that document, they will lay out exactly how they re achieved the 521 diluted and the 909 uh, adjusted. Uh, and if, if they're going to lay that out, we can kind of compare all three sets of numbers then and see what's going on. Uh, it's, it's a myth, I think, for us to assume that value line does a complete readjustment to as reported numbers when they do their analysis. I think here's a case where they're not doing a complete readjustment. Uh, they did allow $2.90 to move back into the 521, but they did not allow enough to bring us uh, to that uh, final number, which means that somewhere along the line, there's some, there's a dollar or so of, of uh, whatever you want to call it. I won't even call it income, but there's a dollar or so of, of uh, money that needs to be accounted for if you're trying to make this whole thing work out. Now, after having said all of that, uh, I really think all that we need to do is be aware of the fact that most analysts are working somewhere along the lines of the $9 rather than the $5.21 that's being reported to the SEC. Uh, and because that's happening, uh, I think that, that there are times when the difference is as large as this difference is, that you either just need to keep that in mind or you need to actually go in and adjust your Morningstar data on your stock selection guide and make it read 909. It's a relatively easy thing to do and the new SSG Plus allows you to make the change and then save it so that that change doesn't need to be made every time you update the data. It needs to be made once and then it's there. And it even makes a notation every time you update that there is data in the Striker SSG that you've saved that differs from the update set that you're gonna be using. Uh, if I'm confusing you on this whole particular uh, roundabout set of data, uh, I think it's important to take away the fact that data sets vary. And I would imagine if we were to pull in four or five other data sets besides Value Line and Morningstar, we'd see other variances within the earnings data as well. Um, I think that's a good reason why Mr. Nicholson and the folks that began the SSG said, let's not take earnings per share as reported from the company, but rather as Manifest does, let's take sales. Uh, I think you'll notice as you look at different data sets that earnings vary widely depending on what they're excluding and what they're including. Whereas sales are sales are sales to uh, paraphrase uh, a well-known poet. And those can't be manufactured too easily and can't be destroyed too easily. You'll find that number, that set of numbers, stays pretty consistent source to source to source. And if you start with sales and then do a preferred procedure, and that's actually what Mark's doing every single time he shows you an analysis, if you do a preferred procedure beginning with sales, then I think what you do is you 
remove in many instances this whole concept of recurring versus non-recurring diluted versus and non-diluted earnings uh normal from the picture. yeah 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 so no, there is there's, that's what there's, i would do is you know start with sales there is one other mystery here and then i'm gonna we'll move on to the next thing but morningstar i believe is pulling analyst consensus numbers here uh to generate this and in the, in the numbers that whatever appears for your uh, N plus one and N plus two years. And uh, I, I can't reconcile, at least not yet, why those numbers are are different than the analyst consensus numbers that we use all the time. So I need to look at that. So on that top, subject for another day, we'll come back to it. That's, Mark, those numbers that Morningstar puts into the tool mm -hmm. uh, on the visual analysis are not the same numbers that you'll find in the Morningstar data set. These are okay. ACE numbers, which they sell as a separate package to better investing as part of a contract with the data. And they're numbers that come from a, uh, a group of analysts and they're not tied to the numbers that the analysis in the Morningstar site uh, actually prints necessarily sometimes you'll find them right smack on sometimes you'll find them very close but in some instances when there's a lot of reconciling to be done you'll find that these numbers vary quite widely from the projections that the morning star analyst is making into the future well yikes you, you just my head just exploded i'm gonna have to dig a little you got deeper. it you got it <laughs> all right and then uh, this individual is also asking, you know, if you're you're looking at Google, uh, why aren't you concerned about some of the trends, earnings and pre-tax profit trends? And this is just something that that I have believed my entire investing career, and it, it's just completely underlined and emphasized. Uh, Nicholson didn't think this way. Um, in fact, he he opposed putting a, the quarterly comparison box on the the stock selection guide. Um, and again, there's just this notion of, and as Ken has made the point, uh, try to understand what you're looking at, whether it's as reported or continuing operations or whatever, um, when you're, when you're dealing with this type of information. And so when you're looking at the output of something like a, a stock selection guide or whatever, and you, you see something like this, the only point to be made here is, you know, they basically said, well, it's a decline. My answer was, well, it's a decline from a absolute a blockbuster record achievement post COVID. So you're basically comparing to a moment in time, which was epic in terms of the, the sales and profitability of this company. And you're basically saying it's gone down. It's, not, it's actually not going down when you look at the, the long-term trend, which is what we try to look at all the time. You had that bubblish moment and you're comparing to, uh, again, an epic moment in the long-term uh, life cycle of the company so be careful when you're making that any comparison you want to make sure that you're you're not mixing uh, apples and pomegranates any other thoughts on this one ken no i just i just like to remind folks that when you're looking at a declining growth you're still looking at growth yeah absolutely and that that's kind of what was hinted at here also that's that's kind of what's going on here also. Um, again, the notion of, you know, what is the company going forward? And in the case of Qualcomm, they basically made some strategic decisions and some portfolio allocations, product portfolio. And you really do have to emphasize the right-hand side of this chart. Actually, you know, long-term trend, it's not dramatically different. But uh, the actual numbers for 2021 through 2022 and then the the forecast actually line up at a fairly decent growth rate, certainly not a growth rate under less than 1% or negative. And uh, in fact, so I'll, I'll, I'll lean on Cy Lynch. Cy Lynch says that a year to year comparison is not a growth rate. Simply, there is no such thing as a one year growth rate. It's a one year difference in sales. Maybe that's a great way to think of it. The growth rate's that red line through the bottom chart. And, uh, 
Also a little clarification on what, where Nicholson became less interested in a large company. So your thoughts, Ken? I just agree with everything on this slide, Mark, that, uh, that I can find interest sometimes uh, in companies that are growing as slowly as three and a half, four, four and a half percent. And uh, there are companies growing at, at six and a half, seven, seven and a half percent, which I can't find interest in. Um, we're, we, we look at companies individually, company by company by company. I think the other important thing is that so many rules that people have put under their investing, uh, maybe too many sometimes, I think the, the rules uh, were there as you learned about investing and the rules were there to keep you on the reservation, to keep you uh, close to uh, like-minded folks and to keep you out of trouble. Uh, but as you mature as an investor, as you grow, uh, I think those rules uh, require constant revisiting. And sometimes uh, there are great companies that don't follow those rules. And that doesn't mean we don't invest in them. Uh, I'm thinking to myself of, of Microsoft and, and Apple and maybe Google that uh, just didn't follow the rules for a long, long time, and yet uh, they become wonderful investments. Even with the decline in Google over the last uh, 11 or 12 months, uh, I certainly can look at my holdings in Google, uh, which I've held for, for a long, long time, and say to myself, even with the most recent decline, uh, the overall return in this stock has just been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that doesn't mean that, that this short period of time, you know, 10, 11, 12 months is enough to change the picture uh, going into the future. Uh, I think Mark's showing uh, the, the future picture for Qualcomm uh, Qualcomm happens to be another of my holdings, and I'm not bailing on this stock at this particular time. Uh, I think it's interesting. Uh, it's not one of my fastest growing holdings, but uh, I think it's it's fairly reliable on what I can expect from it in the next four or five years. All right, so I, I'm going to hit you with one of my rules. It's just a personal observation. I'm using the term rule kind of in jest. But uh, anytime I see this, and when it's applied to earnings, first of all, I don't really do earnings growth, but okay, if you're doing earnings growth on a traditional guide, anytime I see 12%, I think 8%. And I can prove this to you with data. The analyst community is wrong by 50% when it comes to EPS growth estimates. So it's also a guideline to remember. So I always reduce. I basically take a, take a, just the reality that they're off by 50% more often than that. And uh, well, just, just, I have a, again, it's a, I have a similar rule, Mark, uh, but my rule's a little bit more general as it usually is than yours. And my rule basically just says when I read 12% long-term for the, a company this size, I just say to myself too high. Uh, and I don't know if I'd go down to eight, but uh, but 12 is definitely too high in, in my estimation. If it gets there, that's great, uh, but uh, it doesn't usually get there. So it's so, calculus teacher versus engineer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Here's our Music, musical play director versus person that builds the electrical grids. Soccer you know? coach. <laughs> right. Okay. All of those things apply. All right, here's our books again around this time of year. Some of these are excellent. Uh, all of them are good. Some of them are more excellent depending on where a person is in their investing journey. So we just would encourage you to be familiar with some of these. We did add uh, the life after Google as respected or requested by Ken last week. And of course, we've talked a lot about Morgan Housel's book, but these are some of our favorite books. And then Matt uh, Spielman mentioned two books. I'm I'm pretty sure we're going to take a much closer look at Tillinghast's book up at the top there, and then I do want to I I've actually read that one. I've not read Annie Duke's book yet, but intend to. So, just some good stuff here. 
kind of fascinating to follow the career of Joel Tillinghast, uh, one of the more successful um, mutual funds of all time, right alongside Peter Lynch at Fidelity. Any other thoughts on these, Ken? We'll dig into these in the future. Just kind of call I them haven't out. Read, I haven't read either of them, but I've uh, put the top one on my list of, Natalie likes to buy me books for Christmas, so I put the top one on my list for, uh, I wouldn't mind that one showing up under the tree. So there we go. Okay. I, and, and yes, I still read books, but I do read them on tablets now. So <laughs> I've, I've uh, advanced that far into modern uh, I'll, technology. I'll make sure Natalie knows I like books too. Okay. <laughs> and it was my birthday and Christmas is coming. All those things apply. All right. All right. So let's talk about Texas gold and uh, the fuel that drove this family back in the 1960s to Beverly Hills. And uh, this one actually came up in some discussions uh, with uh, an investor about uh, the success that they'd had investing in Texas Pacific land. And then, of course, if you know the story, Jed shoots the ground up from the ground, came up bubbling crude, and that led them to uh, swimming pools and movie stars. But this particular company is kind of fascinating to me. Um, it's a, a exploration and production company out of Texas. It behaves like a REIT. That it's not a REIT. I think it probably behaves, probably treated as a, almost a partnership, but it is publicly traded. But they basically have assets scattered all over the Permian Basin in Texas. This might be one that Lynn Douglas will be educating us on as we take a closer look at this. But, you know, basically they, they own a million acres in, uh, in Texas in one of the most productive energy zones in the world. And uh, from fracking to, to all kinds of energy production, petroleum, natural gas, they do the water stuff. And uh, just, just kind of an interesting company to dig in a little bit deeper. And, again, when we first started looking at this, uh, its returns were kind of off the charts. I could not sink my teeth into it a couple of years ago when we kicked it around briefly. But uh, some of you did, and my hat's off because you basically are looking at this situation. The stock price has gone from 300 back here, back when Lynn was telling us that we should be considering some energy stocks, up to about 2,500 today. And uh, still not dramatically overpriced, although I think it probably has got some room on the downside now. But uh, it's just, I just pointed out as an interesting study and another example of coulda, woulda, shoulda uh, on my part. Um, so I think we'll probably watch this one. It'll be on the radar screen. I do find it kind of compelling that those analyst consensus that we were just beating up actually see it as being fairly undervalued right now. And Ken, I think you said it's just too much to chew on for you. I, uh, it, at the point that I am in my investing career, this one just doesn't take, I don't have the mind to deal with this one right now. <laughs> I got, I got uh, what I think are, they're, they're not as good an idea as an eight bagger, you know, 300 to 2,500, but, uh, but I don't need an eight bagger, eight bagger at this point in my investing career. I, I need some good solid stocks that are going to give me 10, 12, 14%. I think that I have a long enough list right now, so I'll leave this one completely to yeah. you to play around with, Mark. Yeah, and I, again, I, I'm just kind of fascinating, fascinated by this consistency in the growth rate affiliated with just this part of the chart. I mean, it's just kind of amazing to me when it comes down to it. All right, it's time for a cage match. This is basically Santa Claus rally versus uh, the bear market continuing. And the picture up at the top is where I live. That's what we do to the downtown area every year. And it really is quite spectacular if you're ever in the, in the area for uh, Rochester, Michigan this time of year. Ken and Natalie are going to be here next weekend, so maybe we'll take a cruise down there, Ken. That sounds really good, Mark. Yeah, yeah it is a spectacular sight. I'm not sure. I, I think I actually took that picture. It must have been late at night. But, all right, Santa Claus versus the bear, and it's related to that uh, opening slide, bear. He's been kind of nasty for the last couple of years. This is one of Sean Mace's favorite slides. He likes to hang this one at me. It's a look back at 
how the stock market behaved back in 2008, 2009. That's the green area. Again, going back, well, actually 2006 to 2008. So this is how the market behaved. And a number of people have been watching this. And I, I don't know what I think in general about, you know, backfitting this type of a shape over a situation. But their contention is that we ain't done yet. You know, Jerome Powell is going to continue raising interest rates. We're going to have some margin pressures. The dollar is strong, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we basically have some still nasty time to come. What are your what's your feeling on macro expectations, Ken? <laughs> um, I'm not a fan of graphs like this, Mark. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the 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 scale is too short. Uh, I mean, June to December, a uh, year and a half. Uh, I, I think that's too small a scale. Uh, I I think that that given the opportunity to overlay one graph of anything over the graph of something else, I can find uh, periods where they they tend to match each other pretty well. Uh, I think that the circumstances are so different uh, with interest rates moving very, very quickly up in one instance and, and interest rates doing something completely different. Uh, I, I just think there's too much difference between uh, what was happening in the green graph and what is happening now in the white graph. And if we're using this as a predictor, uh, then I think you have a, a, a chance that it'll go up and a chance that it'll go down. Isn't that a great statement to end with? <laughs> yeah, but something you can hear almost daily on CNBC. Um, oh, so you got it. We'll come back and look at this at March and figure out who's right. As for me, I continue to accumulate those uh, longer term uh, NASDAQ 100 positions. And that's kind of based on an argument like this. And this isn't, isn't really an argument. It's just a, a factoid. But it is a reality that, you know, you basically have a tough time in the market around Halloween pretty regularly over the last many years. But uh, it's kind of hard to ignore that. Um, the trends are pretty good when it comes to uh, this month and then these three down here, at least historically. So uh, at some point we snap out of it and I guess this is a little bit of the Santa Claus slash bullish argument, uh, no matter what Mr. Powell does. Later this Mark, could you, could you go back one slide, please? We're getting a lot of folks wanting to know, can they do this for free on a website? Or is this part of your subscription service to the to a website? I think I'm, I'd be challenged, but I think I can do this for free on stock charts. Okay, I'm looking up at the top uh, there where I'm, I'm looking in the upper left-hand corner where it says S&P index, and then it has a date range uh, if if it were me, I would sit down and play with, I don't know if this is stock charts or big charts, uh, but I'd play with both of them and see if you could actually make a graph appear uh, by calling out an index and then a date range after it. Uh, that looks like what might be happening uh, to get this picture. And uh, we don't know what... Uh, uh, overriding program uh, uh, was used here, but you could try bigcharts.com or stockcharts.com. Uh, they both give you some flexibility in, in putting things onto their graphs. A and if you're really interested, I would just play with that a little bit. Yeah. I have a feeling this can be done without too much difficulty uh, by just knowing the proper well, syntax to put in the, the, the choice. I'm going to consider this a personal challenge and I'm going to come up with a graph of the price of tomato seeds versus uh, some other stock market index and I'll match them perfectly and bring it back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. All right. Just now, now I'm, getting, that, uh, I'm getting a comment picture. from Mark. I'm getting a comment from Dean. And he would like to look at slide 15 real quickly, if you could. Dean, okay. And, uh, we're asking, we also have some people asking 
uh, can they duplicate this kind of a thing right now anywhere in Manifest? Uh, we post them on the forum right now. We are actually working to uh, make this come to your fingertips at some time in the future. I don't know when that will be, but we are actually working on it mid-December to uh, basically make this the format of company reports. Okay, so the, the best answer right now is if you would like to see a particular company in this format, uh, leave a uh, request on the forum and, uh, you know, Mark's list is long and uh, he, he he's a single person, but eventually he might be able to get you something like this right up on the forum then. Yeah, we generate them pretty quickly. Uh, I mean, I've, I've answered a couple questions. In fact, open invitation to the audience. If you want to toss some tickers at us for the next couple of uh, full sessions, we'll basically take a look at a few companies in this manner, see what it can tell us and how we can actually use some of this information. There's a lot of information here. I mean, this particular company did, didn't talk about it. They have no long-term debt. They have a whole bunch of cash. That's all kinds of neat stuff that you can dig into when you start um, paying some attention to this stuff. Okay, so yeah, send us a ticker or two and we'll uh, see what we can do. Just some uh, background information. We've basically already said this between inflation and interest rate actions and the strength of the dollar and uh, all the stuff that's going on in the commodity markets, et cetera, um, could, could be a tough time. But then again, you have, uh, as Ken mentioned last week, that he expected uh, some reversals by China. And I thought he was uh, um, impaired or something. And uh, lo and behold, we actually did see some easing uh, in China on some of the stuff that's been going on over there. So we'll see. Jobs data, all kinds of stuff coming at us. And here's that 200-day uh, moving average that people have talked about. Uh, again, it's not something we do much with, but uh, there, some of the people who believe in the Santa Claus rally say that we're at a very key point that if this does head north, it could head north quite strongly. That's all they're talking about. Am I reading that red line correctly, Mark? That's a 50-day moving average, the red line? Yes, shorter term, and the fact that that's inflected up a little bit is significant okay. to somebody who does this. Yep. Okay. You know, in other words, they're, they're seeing a point where this red line will cross this blue line somewhere out here. And if that happens, that can be a magical moment to traders. Not something we pay a lot of attention to, but... It's kind of nice to understand what the, which direction the rhinos are running. All right, so we started, we actually talked about this a little bit. We've got a few minutes left here. Um, actually received multiple emails suggesting to me that love the conversation, love the case studies, but basically asked the question in a number of different ways. Mark, is your premise wrong? And I said, what? <laughs> How dare you? No, um, they basically <laughs> basically said um, the question might actually be: Is Apple a good company? And whoa, that that's that's a little different. And in fact, I'll even twist you a little bit more, Ken. What if Apple is a Chinese company? And of course, I'm using the term you know very loosely, but obviously, with the amount of influence that China has, there are people that actually ask the question in that way. So. Um, just, just something to think about. But when bad things happen to good companies, um, we, you know, they, they talked about a number of case studies over the years. We covered a few of them last week. But you know, Tylenol at Johnson and Johnson was a moment. Um, Chipotle had their moment with their food poisoning, and you can go on and on. Nike had their moment twenty years ago when they had trouble. So yeah, if you can find a moment to to react to when you know you've got a pretty decent company. It can be quite rewarding, but a number of people were asking uh, more along the lines of is is Apple uh, potentially spoiling? You know, I, I don't well, I don't personally believe that, but I can understand how they might ask that question. So anyhow, Morgan Housel came up with these. I think they're three pretty good moments. And uh, again, it kind of dovetails. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ken, but with the the life after Google book a little bit. But uh, technology businesses are tough. Um, I, can, I can point to the formidable Commodore computer or compact computer of a few years ago that doesn't even exist anymore. 
they can be quite messy. But this notion of finding a currently mispriced situation, which could be what, at least in my opinion, what Apple's kind of going through right now and some of the other companies also. What what uh, grabs you here, Ken? Well, what grabs me, Mark, are the last two sentences in the thing. Uh, when you put this slide up and I didn't realize that this uh, quote was going to be chosen, uh, I, I said to myself, I remember reading that uh, in Housel's book and I went to my copy of Housel's book and lo and behold, I had highlighted uh, those last two sentences. Uh, it's a problem that I have a lot of times and that's a loyalty. Loyalty that you uh, feel to a person is one thing. Loyalty that you feel to a stock is something completely different. Um, Apple didn't do anything to make me loyal except make money. And there are some times when stocks stop making money. Uh, and while I'm not ready to unload my Apple stock, never changing your mind, uh, I think is something that's very important to examine uh, on a fairly regular basis. Uh, I especially like Housel's way of putting it at the end there, sign up prenup with every stock you invest in. Sometimes there are good reasons to abandon previously uh, superior stocks and you have to be ready to, to do that uh, if in fact you have good reasons. Uh, uh, I like better to say if you can in fact find a better investment. Yeah, absolutely true. The other thing that kind of is cool here is this notion right here of generating alpha 55 to 65 percent of the time that is literally the same thing as a relative return greater than zero 60 percent of the time which is what we aim for at the round table and even the the, the best portfolios in uh, the groundhog for example over 16 years they're the best ones are basically beating the market 60% of the time with their selections. And that, that is something that we've become kind of accustomed to at the in the Groundhog and uh, the round table. But uh, it just kind of quantifies that in a, in a, a way that I, I don't think we see very often. Um, I think when you and I stuck to Fossil for too long, we were we were being kind of heroic. Uh, which is probably a code word for stubborn. And uh, we got our heads handed to us in the, in the round table on uh, fossil over the long term. We basically ignored some of the, you know, when fossil began leaving dirty sinks in the dish and dirty socks in the living room and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and uh, we did not enforce the prenup. Um, I, I'm, I'm on board with uh, prenups when it comes to individual stocks for sure. I, I won't mention a certain drug stock, Mark, but <laughs> I, I will say that uh, when I invested in that drug stock for the short term and got a, I don't know, about a six and a half bagger out of it and sold it and have never looked back since, uh, I, I felt justified that my my prenup, my my uh, original thinking was probably uh, to the good uh, I know that you're wired to uh, deal with with some of these turnarounds, but uh, I'm just not wired to deal with uh, losing a lot of money and then putting more money into it to try to balance it out. So uh, I'm ready to move on with something. Uh, these top two paragraphs right here uh, remind me that some extremely great companies uh, rode the coattails of founders or of of star CEOs for a long period of time mm -hmm. and then crashed and burned. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of General Electric and Mr. Welch, for example. I'm thinking uh, maybe even, and it, I guess the jury's out, but I'm thinking maybe even of Amazon right now and Mr. Bezos. Yeah, uh, that leads us know. to this one pretty well. I mean... Uh, Costco was named the finance Yahoo Finance Company of the Year, and they actually showed us who they have picked over the last 10 plus years, 11 years, I guess. And uh, uh, the performance is a little lackluster. 
I think that the Zoom video was probably a, a highly questionable long-term selection. It might have been okay at the time it was made, but over the long term, uh, the jury is way out on that one. And then the one that I find fascinating um, as a previous owner of Facebook, um, I had missed the fact that Yahoo Finance called Facebook the worst company of the year a couple of years ago. And uh, that, is, that isn't working out too well here lately. We'll see if uh, their emphasis on meta actually pans out. But kind of interesting to see how challenging this has also been. Look at how wondrous a company Microsoft has been in here over the last year. It's, it's, it's struggled a bit. And there's your Amazon. I was kind of surprised to see the numbers that large on Under Armour. And those are all annualized on the right. Any comments? No, it's. Uh, you just want a different it, shopping. It makes you, I, I think, Mark, it, it makes you less uh, subject to believing in the top stocks for the next year that are always the feature articles in a lot of the finance magazines and in a lot of the shows with people coming on and tell you what their best ideas are going forward. It, it, it leaves me uh, thinking to myself, uh, you know, I can do as good a job as this uh, all by myself. I can, I can pick uh, nine losers out of 10 all by myself. So, <laughs> well, we should probably do a session on cover stocks and, and uh, you know, the cover jinx. And this could certainly be a candidate for that. I, I don't still own Costco, but I did last year and was moving some money around and I have not gone back. Uh, very successful investment in Costco, but look at how well it's done for the round table. I can also remember vividly um, Enron was one of those companies of the year back in the year that they disappeared from the planet and uh, other companies that uh, when they make the covers of the magazine, what is it? Your better homes and gardens curse. <laughs> I had forgotten that, Mark. Yeah, when you when you see your stock advertised on the cover of Better Homes and Gardens, that's a time to run for the hills. <laughs> you, you combine that with a mega corporate office, and you can you can get yeah. there. All right. So with that, just your reminder that we do archive all of these sessions, including the roundtables, full sessions, and any other educational sessions. You can see our best small companies from uh, back around Halloween right here on the Manifest Investing channel at YouTube. If you need help finding that, let me know. But if you do go there and you'd like to be notified anytime that new content is added, just simply subscribe. We'd appreciate that. We are up to about 940 subscribers now, and we would like to push over into uh, four digits here pretty soon. So with that, we'll leave with uh, a current event that is happening. You recognize that, Ken? Uh, that's the lava flow from Mauna Loa, right? It is. It's pretty spectacular. It's one of the biggest eruptions in Hawaii for quite some time, and some of the nighttime uh, time lapse photography is getting pretty I spectacular. I think they're there. This is the first time Mauna Loa's uh, actually erupted in forty years. I think, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, and it, the the lava is just leaping out of some of the fissures going down the side of the mountain and stuff. It's uh something else all right so with that uh, in your appendix is the the thing we don't talk about every month anymore but we are still winning can not let me say anymore <laughs> all right so with the hot lava and our our, you know, our friend from maryland mark uh mr galagli uh wonders if we'd like to try a bull session where we make a concerted effort to pick the worst performing stock for the coming year <laughs> <laughs> I think we do that often enough without having to try. You know? Well, that actually inspires me to pull out a report I did a few years ago where we actually did that with Goldman Sachs. We picked their their 40 best and their 40 worst for the coming year. I'm not making this up. I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't mind taking somebody's list and trying to do that, but <laughs> using the entire stock market, boy, there's the, the choices are there. We just... We just don't know how bad some of these companies really are. So, in the in that case of Goldman Sachs, and again, I have I have friends at Goldman Sachs, love Goldman Sachs, but in that case, the the forty companies that they were basically shorting, 
actually outperformed the four their forty best selections for the next year. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's documented. It's in, it's at manifest, and uh, just one of those immortal Muppet head scratching moments. But Kevin, we may take you up on some flavor of that at some point. All right. So, Mark, else? I've kept up on the question box pretty well, and uh, All right, I so don't see we have anything. So we just reconvene uh, seven days from now, uh, next Tuesday. And meanwhile, wish everybody great hunting for the last minute gifts and uh, get those decorations up and let's get in the Christmas spirit and start seeing what we can do to make the world a better place. Yeah. And if you have any companies you'd like us to throw on that uh, extended analysis, let me know. Send an email to me right there, Mark at manifestinvesting.com. And uh, we'd be happy to uh, tinker around and see what we can learn from it. Thanks, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody.